Water is ubiquitous on Earth, present in all its possible forms. And even in us, it constitutes nearly 65% of our mass. And yet, most of the water we depend on for life is invisible to us. It is literally underground, stored in groundwater tables, which can be gigantic. In fact, it is estimated that there is nearly a hundred times more water currently buried in the bowels and faults and interstices between stones than in all the lakes, clouds, and rivers of our entire planet. In other words, while 97% of the water available on Earth is salty, 2% is in the form of ice. Almost all of the small remaining 1% that is fresh and liquid that interests us so much is beneath us, in the form of so-called invisible water, groundwater. Of course, these groundwater sources in which we are evolving are not representative of how blue gold is stored on a global scale. Our perceptions are deceptive. Our imagination tends to conjure up images of rivers, partially flooded cavities, and underground lakes. But in reality, Networks like the ones we're currently navigating, hidden beneath the tropical forests of the vast Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico, having been carved out over millions of years by the work of water-dissolving limestone, are very special cases. Because while here, the nature of the rock has allowed for nearly 7,000 kilometers of gallery networks to form, wide enough to move about in the vast majority of cases, groundwater is not stored like this. And putting a camera inside these reserves would result in showing you nothing more than this on screen, saturated porous rocks plunged into eternal darkness. That's why, to avoid spending an entire episode in total darkness, we will illustrate these blue gold resources by shining our projectors on the enchanting and mysterious landscapes of the Yucatan Cenotes. Here like elsewhere in the world, groundwater trickling through pores and micro cracks will end up if they encounter a waterproof layer during their descent, gradually filling every available nook and cranny to form aquifers. In other words, to form rock reservoirs that can store large quantities of water. These amounts of water that rocks can store, we've had fun measuring them. And since the numbers always blow my mind, I'll give them to you just like that, just to share my dismay. A cubic meter of sand and gravel can hold up to 400 litres of water, sandstone from 50 to 200 litres, and a cracked limestone from 10 to 100 litres. In fact, even something as dense and seemingly impenetrable as granite, if it's cracked, can hold from 1 to 50 litres of water per cubic metre of rock, to the point of eventually making up truly gigantic reservoirs, sometimes just a few metres under the surface as at other times seeping several kilometres deep into the rock. Thus, the Great Artesian Basin, the largest freshwater reserve in Australia, starts at 100 metres deep on the outskirts, but can reach 3 kilometres at its centre, all while extending under the surface, over an area equivalent to 23% of the continent. And if we find under the surface, in these arid regions, such quantities of fresh water, it's almost always because the climate there was different in the past. Don't necessarily trust what we can see on the surface. 50,000 years ago, and for nearly 40,000 of them, a large part of the vast desert of sun-crushed sand and stone, which is now the Sahara, was then a grassy tropical savanna in places covered with large lakes and subject to intense rainfall. Thus, under this dried-up mineral world, there are immense reserves of so-called fossil water, created by tens of thousands of years of runoff and infiltration of rains deep into the ground. Thus, under the surface of the Sahara, there are numerous underground freshwater tables, the most impressive of these reserves being very certainly that of the Nubian sandstone aquifer system, which, stretching under the surface for nearly three times the area of metropolitan France, would contain some 150,000 cubic kilometres of fossil water. A volume so extraordinary that it could completely cover a country as large as Libya, with 100 metres of fresh water. We could provide many more examples like this. 
In total, it is estimated that the amount of water contained in the African subsoil is approximately 100 times greater than that which falls on the surface each year in the form of rain. On this continent as elsewhere, almost everywhere in the world, the subsoils seem to be brimming on paper with an almost inexhaustible quantity of fresh water. Tapping into it could potentially solve all problems related to access to drinking water. Except that in reality, on average, only a tenth of these underground resources are actually exploitable. Under the southern Libyan desert, the rains from the highly controversial Great Man-Made River Project, which exploits the precious underground blue gold reserves, are already descending to more than 400 metres deep. And it is believed that at the rate we're tapping into them, in 50 years, these aquifers should be about 100 metres lower than they are today. And as vast as it might be, these reserves, which have taken millennia to form, are unfortunately not eternal. To illustrate, let's take the example of what has likely been the most studied on Earth, the immense Ogallala Aquifer, which in the United States of America extends under the Great Plains of eight different states. There, in a mix of sand, silt, clay and gravel, rests one of the most precious treasures of the North American continent. Because the Ogallala, besides having a funny name, provides drinking water to millions of Americans and indirectly also feeds them. To grasp it, let's take a step back. In this satellite photo, we can see 1,400 square kilometres of fields, which in Kansas are all irrigated with water drawn from underground aquifers. In fact, in these regions, in the middle of the last century, by relentlessly drawing from this enormous mass of water and with the invention of centre pivot irrigation, a large part of the lands located above the aquifer have become some of the most productive in the world in just a few years. Except that, although groundwater is a renewable source in this region, Ogallala is not replenishing as fast as it's being depleted. Thus, since 1950, the amount of water it contains has been reduced by nearly 10%. This may seem small, but already many wells have dried up, and it is estimated that if they continue to draw from it at the rate they are, American farmers should see this aquifer dry up in about 20 years. Not in the sense that there will be no more water in it, but where this resource will become impossible to extract and exploit. In these regions, rainwater infiltration rates are low and only a small part actually reaches the natural reservoirs, to the point where it is thought that once depleted, the aquifer should take more than 6,000 years to fully recharge. When one considers that today, nearly a third of the irrigated lands throughout the United States rely on this aquifer, one becomes aware of the importance of this invisible water. In South America, the prodigiously huge Guarani Aquifer, which itself would contain some 50,000 cubic kilometres of fresh water, enough to easily ensure two centuries of global water consumption, is already somewhat in danger, not by the amount of liquid we take from it, but by what descends from the surface into it. Because the 50,000 trillion tonnes of drinking water that are there are spread between 800 and only 50 metres deep. And where the aquifer comes close to the surface, unsanitary or polluted water-like pesticides can seep in and slowly contaminate it. Beyond pollution, another less obvious phenomenon can also threaten these massive freshwater reserves. One of the world's largest underground water tables known as the Albion, which straddles Libya, Tunisia and Algeria, is mostly undrinkable because seawater has managed to infiltrate it deep inland, making it brackish over hundreds of kilometres. And to see for yourself the ocean infiltrating beneath our continents, you need to dive into these tunnels that we are crossing, these galleries filled by the rain and rivers that have seeped in. The water is clear and sweet, but as you go deeper, in places, about 10 metres down, you reach a strange layer of water. Vision becomes blurred at its level. Hallucinated steam swirls seem to dance on the surface of a fuzzy border, a limit called halocline, and whose existence proves that as weird as it may seem, the oceans rush and infiltrate even under our continents. There, 
Several kilometers as the crow flies from the first beaches, about 10 meters deep under the jungle, you find salt water, which due to its high density, refuses to mix with the fresh. And at the level of the thin layer that separates them, over a few tens of centimetres, their mixture produces a blurry swirl effect. And once past this turbulence, you sort of enter the part of the oceans that hide under the continents. If we can find the presence of the sea under the lands, it's because salt water, like rainwater, is able to infiltrate laterally and progress through the slightest cracks that the rock offers it. Here, under the Yucatan Peninsula, the depth of the interface between these two worlds increases as we move away from the coast. Usually located between 10 and 20 meters deep near the ocean, the limit between salt water and fresh water can go down to 50 or even 100 meters in the middle of the peninsula, more than 100 kilometers inland. Thus, almost everywhere across the world, if you go too deep into the aquifers with your wells, you risk bringing the sea back to you. Of all the resources that nature offers us for free, groundwater is, in volume, the most exploited worldwide. A majority of these waters drawn from the subsurface are used for agricultural purposes. They allow us to irrigate about 70% of the cultivated lands in Europe, 75% in Morocco, 95% in Tunisia, and even 100% in Arabia. Globally, a third of the population depends on these groundwater tables for drinking water. Knowing how to manage our resources, ensuring that we can continue to draw from their sources, allows our descendants to enjoy the pleasure of drinking water that, before coming out of the faucet, has been filtered through the ground for sometimes thousands of years. A big thank you to the City of the Ocean and the Bayeritz Aquarium for supporting the creation of this episode and for offering us a bubble away from the world of land dwellers, privileged access to the underwater mystery. At the aquarium, you will be able to contemplate in their reconstructed natural habitats the fascinating inhabitants of salty and fresh waters from most of the liquid and inhabited environments of our planet, like bubbles away from the world of land dwellers. At the City of the Ocean, you will discover a wealth of playful and intelligent content about the ocean. Exhibitions, workshops and experiences, like visual surfing on dynamic boards, or even live a deeply disturbing immersive experience with 700 sharks in the night, to understand while having fun. In short, you will find there many ways to access what is hidden on the other side of the mirror under the surface of the waves. As seen, occasionally even below the lands. For their support, gurgle on them, and above all, gurgle on you.